Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is March 25th, 2015, and we are in the last week, I was just told, of uh, Walk My World, something that started in January. Um, Ian, I don't know if you... I, I've been referring to your challenge that you put up on your blog. Um, maybe it's come from somewhere else, but we need an origin story um, and a, a story of where what you all have been doing and why you've been doing it and uh, what Walk My World is. Um, it came up a few different times um, uh, as we were talking about open education and as we were messing around with Genius and anyway, uh, in shows recently, so I thought, you know what, let's find out really what Walk My World is all about. Um, Ian volunteered to gather some friends um, and so I'm going to start off with you, if you don't mind, if you could introduce yourself briefly and introduce the cast of characters here tonight. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having us on, Paul. Uh, my name is Ian O'Byrne. I'm an assistant professor uh, currently at University of New Haven. Um, I, uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let my uh, cast of characters go through and introduce themselves first, and then I can give an overview of how we got to here. We haven't actually done a sound check with it. Alicia, is it? Yep. Hi. Oh, hi. You want to start off since your name is A. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, my name is Alicia Magnifico. I'm an assistant professor at the University of New Hampshire. Um, I primarily teach pre-service English teachers. And I will tell you that my internet has been a little bit funny tonight. So if it drops or the video gets weird, tell me and I'll turn the video off. That will probably help. Lovely, lovely curtains, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Greg. I'm uh, Greg McVary. I'm an assistant professor at Southern Connecticut State University um, and have been playing with this group now for about two years. This is our second iteration of Walk My World, so it was a lot of fun. Ah, so I didn't even know that. Okay. <laughs> we'll get there. Oh, yeah. Kate. See? Yes, Kate. Oh, cool. Yeah, there's Katie and Kate. Uh, I meant Kate. Hi, Katie. Yeah. Hi. Kate, can you hear us? Yeah, yes, I can. I was just Good. letting Katie speak. So oh. I, I also get cold. No, don't freeze. Don't freeze, Kate. <laughs> no. Um, in uh, New South Wales in a coastal town called Coffs Harbour, um, Australia, and it's currently midday, and I'm actually not on class because I had a wisdom tooth pulled um, oh. a few days ago, so a yeah. little bit sore, but it's all good. Uh, yeah, and I got invited to uh, join the Walk My World journey by Ian um, this year and to um, help um, facilitate some of the learning events which has been really wonderful after um, my uh, last year when I participated with a lovely one school, uh, a little tiny school of about 15 students from kindergarten to year six participated in some of the learning events from 2014. Um, so yeah, I really loved it and that's how I got involved. How big is your large, your community where you live? Are you rural uh, or Coffs Harbour? It's uh -huh. regional. It's around seventy thousand. It's pretty okay. spread out, um, but uh, yeah, and it's uh, subtropical. So very similar, I suppose, to Hawaii. I think is a um, uh, we've got mountains that come right down to the um, the ocean, um, and we've got a lovely big marine park. We're very fortunate. It's it's a beautiful environment. Um, Lots of bananas, and uh, yeah, a very big Indian community as well who uh, do a lot of the farming. So, um, but we're just about 500 kilometres um, north of Sydney and 500 kilometres south of Brisbane, basically. So we're right in the middle, but a yeah. lovely spot. Thanks for paint, painting that picture for us, Katie. Welcome. Oh. Hi, can you all hear me? We can hear you fine. Very good. Go I, I'm hoping. Um, okay, so um, well, my name's Katerina Silvestri. Um, I go by Katie. And um, I am a doctoral student and graduate assistant at the University of Buffalo. 
um, where I do, I'm a research assistant, and last semester I also uh, co-taught a uh, literacy methods, uh, middle grades methods course with my uh, advisor, and um, I don't know, I, I, uh, I got Ian's email through the LRA listserv, and I just, you know, because literacy and technology are uh, two of my research interests, obviously, um, I wanted to jump in on it. It sounded really cool, and it's been uh, pretty amazing ever since. I feel like I've learned a ton in a very short amount of time, and um, lots of opportunities here have opened up. It's been fantastic. Interesting. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> we started Walk My World actually <clears throat> two years ago, and it actually builds off of a uh, <clears throat> five-year project that we've been doing with um, NCT, exploring different poet laureates in technology. And we ended up doing Robert Haas next year, last year, but connected um, connected it to uh, Twitter. And we, we had so many content area teachers um, join on, or, or, or pre-service teachers that are in content areas that um, kind of the needs turned away from poetry. And last year we explained, like, what naming things meant. Um, and this year we kind of forked it into what does your identities mean and how do we... You know, we wanted it to kind of be an opportunity for pre-service teachers um, to explore how images shape identities and then how they need to really think about shaping their own professional identities in network spaces just for their own learning and then just, you know, to get a job. Cool. Stephanie, introduce yourself if you don't mind. I don't mind a bit. I'm, okay. I'm Stephanie Loomis. I'm finishing up my master's in education, hoping to start a PhD in the fall. And I started last year with the first iteration in one of my grad courses uh, with Ryan Risch and got completely hooked. And now this is kind of within the focus of my research the last year. Cool. And your mentioning of Ryan Risch uh, reminds me to say that we're going to follow up on this in a couple of weeks. So if you weren't able to get on this conversation, we're going to try to get other people to join it too. So that there's that. Um, and Chris Sloan, welcome. Hi Paul. Oh, hi Paul and everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I've just uh, heard of this, uh, and last year or maybe two years ago, I feel like I um, either was going to or did an initial uh, volley into the walking in my world, and so I'm always interested in just uh, connecting with others, other educators. So I'm here to just learn. Oh, wonderful! So. Is the, is this a multi-headed um, leadership kind of thing, or you know, how did it? Who's who's sort of sponsoring this? Who's uh, making it happen? Where does it begin? So yeah, so this is all open. Um, you know, as Greg mentioned, this started off as a NCT research project that uh, Greg and Sue started off. Uh, we were looking at using uh, multimodal text to have students think about poetry. And then basically what would happen is after the session at NCTE, we would all get together and debrief and talk about, okay, what are we going to do next year? Um, and so it was two years ago, three years ago in Boston that um, we basically got together and, and we're talking about, you know, using Robert Haas's poetry and wouldn't it be cool if we could um, use Twitter as a way and, and organize around a hashtag to find like a third space so that people could connect and students could share a walk in somebody else's world or a walk in their world with somebody else. Um, and so uh, last year we had the, the first version that ran it focused all on poetry. Uh, this year uh, we decided that we wanted to uh, focus on identity. So from the very beginning this thing has all been open. Uh, this is an open learning experience. This is also open research. Um, so this year, as we were planning, we had our planning meetings on uh, Google Hangout on air, so you can go back and watch us try and figure out how to make this happen. Um, you know, we invited anybody in that wanted to be, you know, to, to join us. Um, we collect data and we make it uh, overt on the website that we are collecting data. Uh, our goal is to figure out ways that we can change what's happening in the classroom change the way that our students interact with text and, and read and write online informational text. Um, 
So I mean, it's it's all open. So every single one of us is a is a facilitator. We all help organize and help run this thing. Um, you know, and, and the data is out there. We we research it. We're writing about it. Uh, you know, we were in we were uh, in the MIT Civic Media Reader Press that just came out, and we have I think two other chapters or three other chapters um, that are out uh, and articles about the research that we're doing. So yeah, I mean, it's a, it is a, a multi-headed beast, but it's a lot of fun. In many ways, it's um I think it's a better model, and I, I hate to see the word MOOC because it makes me throw up in my mouth. But um, this idea that we have like a lot of these tiny local nodes, and then a global hub with a, with a shared curriculum. But some teachers might just do like three of the events, and some teachers might do all ten. Um, so the ability to kind of fork it at your local level, but still have this kind of like global network that you can connect with. Um, I think is a very powerful model because you you have teachers on the ground, your boots on the ground, and you know eyes in the sky kind of thing. Beyond Twitter, where's the global hub? How does, so um, we'll, go ahead. Ian. So when we organized this, what we did was we said, um, you know, each one of us. It originally so the main thrust of this is a bunch of instructors at pre-service teacher institutions. And so we wanted to work with our students to help them think about text and rewrite text. And so we have a series of 10 learning events. Um, you know, it's pretty much one learning event per week. And what we wanted to do is provide uh, a meaningful but relatively low level of entry. And then the thinking was that, you know, this work would be done in the open using Twitter as a, as a third space for people to get out and interact and connect and learn. Um, and so, you know, we had people starting off with that low level, level of entry, but then for their populations, they can build on it. So with my students, you know, in my classes, I pretty much at, expect just the basic learning event. Um, but then, you know, Kate is working with her students, you know, and she might expand on it. So it's it's using the hashtag as a way to organize this, but then seeing what different magical things can happen at different places around the world. Mm -hmm. Somebody want to jump in with an example? What did it look like in your space on week three or two or four? I can tell you about what we're doing at UNH right now. Um, mm -hmm. I have actually, um, with my students, they are, they're English majors. We have a very, very low tech English lit program. And they basically do a full literature major before they start to think about their teaching careers. And as such, a lot of them came into my class, despite the fact it's, it, it's a teaching digital literacies class, but they came in, many of them saying, I'm tech illiterate, I don't really understand what I'm doing, I'm interested, I want to know, but, but I don't know how to get there. Um, and, and, and These many, people are all ho 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 holding cell phones, as they said that? Yes. <laughs> okay, just, just yes. checking. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Go exactly. Ahead. Yeah. And then there's that, that whole mm -hmm. kind of, I can use it to interact, I'm not sure that I can use it to compose kind of mentality. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I realized I wanted to do, what week was Mirror Week? Was Mirror Week six or seven? Seven. Seven. Um, I think when that one came out, I, I realized that what I really wanted to do was have them spend a little bit more time building a full digital poem um, and, and really thinking about the idea of, okay, what does it mean to put image or to put sound or to put graphic design to somebody else's words? Um, because many of them had jumped in and had shared had shared photos or shared tweets in in the weeks beforehand, but I realized at that point I was like, okay, we need to we need to fork it a little bit because I want them to go a little bit deeper into this particular activity and get all the way from point A to to point B. Um, so that's something we've been working on. Many of them shared their digital poems yesterday or the day before, um, and and now now we're going to thread ourselves slowly back into the group. Because we've been off in our own little digital poetry world for a little while. 
Greg, can you explain what that uh, link was there? Maybe. Uh, yeah, well, I just dropped it. I'll drop it over in the um, ed tech okay. chapter. This is just um, what I did, and I did miss some of them, is um, I use a tool, um, uh, the, basically the Twitter archive, the Google Sheets archive that Martin Hossie made, um, and Storify, and that's to curate the weekly um, activities. I, I was able to get it done a couple weeks, um, whereas because I can just search for um, the word Dawn, and you know anybody who put the word Dawn in, I could you know grab their their tweets and throw them into a Storify. Um, so that's and then I did a little bit of very basic kind of analysis where I just grouped them. Oh, that's an outside picture, so that goes in the outside pile. Um, so let me go through that link over in EdTech ch or the ed, the EdChat the TTT channel right now. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, that's a collection and an example of all the talks. And I think what what um, Alicia was saying is, is and what Ian said matches perfectly well. We wanted very low barriers of entry. Um, make a connection. Like for, connection was our first content, and then allow people to kind of explore and remix. I know me personally, I spent a lot of time um, making remixes of academic articles. I've never done that before in my life. Um, but I really wanted to try um, learning how to kind of remix academic writing in imagery and sound. And then, of course, as soon as I did, Ziga shut down. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, that was my big challenge. And we had so many different challenges at so many different levels. Like we have Kate students, and she, she can share. You should, Kate, you should share the um, examples that you some of your classes did. Um, was that... I, I, I suppose I can share a contrast with the mirror. Um, actually, I was really pleased. I didn't know how it would go. I've got a very packed curriculum, and I had I got permission to. Um, I'm just running two extra projects with my children, because my, my background was actually. They're very young, right? So, uh, yeah, they are young, but you've uh, got a packed but very <laughs> capable. Yeah, my my original position before becoming the classroom. Um, year one teacher was I actually did enrichment and I use a lot of digital technologies, virtual technology um, mm -hmm. for gifted and talented students and more year six, uh, year five, year six, so stage three. So, um, But children are very capable and I also have another degree in um, early childhood so um, it's um, children are, it's just how you present it, how you um, introduce it. So. Um, all of, as Greg said and as um, Ian said, it was very open, low entry, um, and you could take it wherever you wanted to. I think that was the beauty of it. And um, uh, so for Mira, for instance, um, which um, Ian uh, put up, that was that was wonderful for the children because they they already had a lot of background knowledge on what a mirror was, and they had seen films and stories and um, myths and legends. Um, I was really surprised when um, you know Medusa came up in the mirror. <laughs> that was from a five-year-old, so she knew this. Mm -hmm. That's really so, um, down. It, it just, it, it's um, it just develops because I only have that one day. Essentially, I take time from all my other areas, and I go, okay, I've got this one session to do this in, and I just let it. I actually roll with the kids, and what comes out of it isn't actually planned. So we we ended up. Uh, brainstorming about mirrors, and um, we looked, and they were really intrigued with the uh, the, the the I I've forgotten what the name is, uh, Harry Potter in Harry Potter, the mirror um, where Harry is looking into this mirror and he sees his parents who have passed away, and um, not to go into a lot of detail, but a number of my children have lost parents in the class um, through. Yeah. Anyway, and including myself, and uh, um, therefore, it, what was really interesting was when we decided to use our foil, and we found all these bits of cardboard, and we turned them into mirrors, and they uh, we'd been creating this mural the week before, um, using tracing around CDs, and they said, oh, we can put the we can create an image of ourselves and I said well that's a great idea how about we see what uh, how about you draw what you want to see in that mirror 
you know, what reflection would you like to see? And then it all just started coming out and it was all about family and um, that was what was really wonderful. It was just a really beautiful, um, amazing um, experience actually to see what these children... And the shame was was that I couldn't record the discussions, you know, the end result and they, they, they created this mirror and where they'd either see their father reflected at or maybe it was a lost pet or it was family in Africa or Iran um, that didn't make it to Australia. I have a number of refugee children. Um, uh, so it was really um, a really lovely experience um, and, and in that case they didn't create a poem as such but um, the language that and the discussion that came out of it was just really exceptional. And that, um, yeah, I don't stop it. I just throw every, anything else that's planned for the day, I just sort of throw out of the window when it sort of takes on a life of its own. And I'm just fortunate that I'm, I can do that. And we play catch up later. Uh, but yeah, that was a, I, I had some really good ones actually. In the mirror, I think the Dorothy McKellar. Um, I was a, a little bit selfish there, choosing an Australian uh, mm -hmm. poet, uh, but it was a beautiful poem. Uh, so Dawn, um, the virtual high fives they loved, yeah, the totem, fun. the tattoos yeah. was fabulous. Um, so the mirrors, the totems, um, they loved the virtual high fives, um, especially the Adventure Time one from Ian. And, Kate, uh, can, and Kate can I, can I, I love hearing this all, but I, I mean, and we, we have a very, um, you know, generous group here, um, so we, we'll all accept that you abandon your curriculum and just do whatever, but can you say why you do that? Well, it all actually... I, I won't say necessarily I abandoned the curriculum. I can be okay. very creative in how I tie it into the curriculum mm. because um, I have particular learning outcomes that I have to meet. Um, my assistant principal, my stage leader, I'm stage one. That's year one, year two in Australia, uh, in New South Wales is stage one. And it just happened that the whole umbrella, the overarching theme of identity and belonging uh, with the Walk My World um, uh, project fitted in beautifully with what uh, I was doing with the children um, and what was what I needed to teach them. So it fitted in really well with the themes from the English curriculum, uh, with my history curriculum or my, um, uh, it all tied in really well. So in actual fact, um, yeah, I could easily link it up. So even though I might have been um, abandoning perhaps something I was going to do um, uh, um, on a history, uh, a history unit that I was doing, in actual fact this was a lot more authentic and meaningful to the children. So um, uh, it, yeah, it, and also we've got what's called PDHPE. So um, PDHP is this phys physical development and health. So all the interpersonal and um, the social emotional uh, well-being, and of course this tied in beautifully as well. So I, uh, yeah, it's okay. it was really good stuff. It was good work, and um, the I only I've got parent meetings. I am uh, last night and tonight. Um, which I am turning up for, and all the parents have spoken about the Walk My World project and how their children really enjoyed that. So um, that was yeah, really yeah. here. I've always wondered how did the parents, because, I mean, the stuff that you share last mm. year and this year has been fantastic. You know, I mean, you've mm. been very open. You've shared student work. You know, some of it's pictures or screenshots of what your kids build and share. You know, you'll, you'll share the work on your blog for the, the totem piece. You had one of the students, I think it was her mother in there, yeah. showing her tattoos. How receptive are the parents to you doing this and having their children do work and interact globally with the hoodlums that are on this you know, group? Um, I actually created, because um, part of... Um, I think good digital um, or best practice in digital, uh, digital citizenship. Sorry, I've got this big lump on the side that's screwing with my tongue a bit. Sorry, um, but um, um, part of the uh, the really good way to teach kids about digital citizenship is to get them 
to a certain degree out there. And it's called the lived curriculum. There's a um, Dr. Bronwyn Stuckey um, speaks about, about the lived curriculum and that um, in order to um, 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 really um, teach meaningfully about good digital citizenship practice, you need to actually be on a blog or you need to be using the tools and uh, be online. Um, the one thing, as you've probably noticed is, and I'm very well, we have a class Twitter account, Booth's class, which is our Twitter, and we have our class blog. Um, prior to that, I actually had a very detailed letter and permission form that went home to every parent. What was going to be out there? You okay? What was, no, yeah, no, what, was going, what was going out there? Um, that the fact that it isn't just a footprint. I think I, I uh, it is a tattoo as such. You know, once you're out there, you're out there forever. And um, so that the parents were very aware. I also spoke to the children quite in detail about it beforehand. Children do have a lot of voice in this, and that they were comfortable. And I did a little bit of a moot. on digital citizenship a couple of years ago and uh, it was raised and and I and I think it can be a contentious issue that well hold on a minute minute how can a 5 year old actually give their permission you know emotionally they're not that they're not, they're not that developed to really understand the um, the implications long term of suddenly having a digital identity so I've had to be very careful, I suppose. Um, but I did have parent permission. Anything that goes online is actually either through the Booths class Twitter. So um, uh, that's. Um, yeah. I had permission from the principal and um, from parents, yeah. Kate, I'm not, not, not going to let you get away with uh, changing the metaphor without explaining a little bit more, and then we'll go on to other people. So you, you want to change footprint to uh, tattoo? Do you <laughs> well, I think I read that on one of one of the blogs, either Greg's or could have been Ian's, and I thought that is so true because it isn't a footprint. It's, it, you know, once you're online, you're online forever. You know, that, that image, whatever, um, um, is there. And, uh, but... I think um, my role, um, and part of the reason why, I'm a new scheme teacher. So I'm an. Um, it was a new um, 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 role for me. I graduated in 2013, and I did my teaching degree through Southern Cross University, and uh, so I quite relate to all the pre-service teaching and, and what you're all doing with pre-service teachers and I did one of my units was digital technologies and in 2011 basically all I could do was send an email and since then I got offered a chance to work with virtual technologies and it sort of ballooned from there. Um, the uh, As a result um, I have always been employed um, d working with uh, schools, digital technologies, all the schools that I've been in um, have wanted blogs. They've wanted it's. They were. I. I think. Um, I also have followed a lot the work of Bronwyn Stuckey, and about not having closed, being closed behind. Um, um, you know, password protected blogs or password because I. I think it's a. Uh, um, a a duty that at the end of the day these kids are online whether or not there is an age limit for Twitter or for um, Facebook or for whatever um, um, they are online at home their and um, therefore I have a role to really model best practice and in order and and with the, we have a new curriculum coming through digital technologies curriculum through the Australian and that really mandates that um, you know we need to start to um, really be wise up and embed these really good quality um, digital citizenship skills. Am I waffling or? Uh, no, yeah. okay. thank you. It's nice. It's nice to have the time to listen and, and have you talk. It's great. Others want to jump in with examples or thoughts at this point. 
I had a question. Um, <laughs> I can pose it. So I'm hearing that um, Ian, you pose the, you make the prompt sometimes. Other people make the prompts as well. So, um, so what we did is, and, and um, let me ask. Let me. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, go no, you can uh, go ahead. So uh, one of the things that we did was we, you know, had different teams and we would, you know, organize the labor. And we had a uh, three or four people that would pull together and, you know, we would brainstorm on what the prompts would be. Um, and we tried to have students look. You know, have a, have one or two texts, um, and, and we all view text as being very broad. And so that was one of our goals to have students look broadly at text, but also be able to look across text and synthesize and, pro and possibly remix text. Um, so uh, we would have the prompts put together. Uh, they're all up on the Google Doc. That's that's still out there online and is public. Um, and then and what I would where do can is, people find it? Uh, I'll put it in the, the link. Um, but if so I would basically Sunday mornings uh, synthesize everything together, put it up on the Google site and share it. Um, and, and our focus was we wanted to have something that was relatively low level of entry, but people could go very deep and very broad. Um, you know, so Kate students could dig in, Alicia students could dig in. You know, my students, a lot of them were were terrified. You know, they, they didn't use Twitter at all. They were, you know, adults that had never used Twitter and they never thought it could be used instructionally. Um, These are so, pre-service teachers or teachers? Yeah, pre-service teachers. Um, and, and one thing that, that we should point out now, too, is that, you know, for last year and this year, there are 10 learning events. It is a, uh, a an open-ed experience. It is, you know, for lack of a better term, a MOOC. It's more mentored than massive. Um, but it's, it's out there. All 10 learning events are out there. So those of us that started two and a half months ago were in learning event 10, but that doesn't mean that it's all over. You know, there are waves of people that are going through at different speeds, um, and also all of the learning events are all out there. I think that they're pretty powerful, um, and so, you know, feel free to take them. Use them in your classroom. Take one, take all. Use them in your classroom. Use them with your students from K through 12 up through higher ed. Um, if you complete them all, we have a badge available on Peter Peter U that you can basically say, "Hey, I, I completed all this. I curated all of my work into one text, and now I want to apply for a badge." So, you know, I mean, the, some of us are finishing, but some of us are still just getting started. So I want to get into, not just with you and with others, um, like what makes for a good prompt? And I was wondering if we could ask that in the negative first. Like was there a prompt that kind of isn't working? I think... Or as we, well as the others. I think when we get <laughs> yeah. too complex, you know, part of the challenge was we would... This year we had great people working on making it and... and the, the, to me, the, the, the great part is um, Stephanie and Kate and Sue Ringler-Pet, who couldn't make it tonight, they would script out the initial prompts, and then Christy Pytash and I would go back and revise and edit and get them cleaned up. But the three of them initially would keep us honest. You know, we, we couldn't go too far down the, the rabbit hole because they would keep us honest and... And you know, just say, hey, we need something that can you know, can appeal to a first or second grade student and a forty-five-year-old adult. Uh, so we needed that That's ability criteria. to look yeah. across. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. And um, I mean, I hate to sound like a bore, but predictive text structure helps in instructional design. Um, every single, like, just like you set up your missions, every single one was set up the um. The same way it was, you know, you had the, the the intro text followed by your task, and then followed by a guiding example, yeah. um, and so you you knew how to, to read it um, as quickly as possible, um, and so I think that helped out a bit is just having that. And then we, one of the changes that we did this year is last year we didn't really we just had them sharing pictures for the first five weeks. We were just like we were, went real slow last year. Um, this year we still did very, I don't want to say basic, that's the wrong word, because for some people getting on Twitter is not basic. Um, but what we did is we focused in on making connections first in weeks one and two. 
Um, like the first event was just share a high five. And as Kate said, like if you want to do, if you want to introduce technology with kids, we figured it out. <laughs> the virtual high five is, is the thing to do. It is, it is the, it is the, you know, it's the LOL cat of, of, of for, for the kids. Um, and they love seeing the different, um, the way that different high fives came through, whether they're gifts or videos or, or all kinds of things. And then sec- and then they had to share a picture of their door. Like, what's your front door? Um, one thing that I'd like to push more on back on is most, and I don't know, I'd love to see the breakdown once we look at the results, the difference between the literal and the metaphorical thinking. Like, share a picture of your door. There was... 95% was literally, this is my door. But you had that, you know, interesting, like, 5% that would, like, this is the door to my soul, you know, or, you know, like, that would take some kind of metaphorical approach to it. Um, so I think, let's let Stephanie jump in here. Yeah, Stephanie, jump in. What, what do you mean some of the projects were hard? Um, well, one of the prompts, and it's actually one of the more recent ones, talked about the idea of what is a hero and, what is your heroic journey, and how are you a hero? Well, that's not something that I've really thought about. It's interesting. I think that one for younger kids who you know are really still into comics and and heroes and Superman and stuff, that might be more approachable. But for me, as a 50-year-old <coughs> um, almost grandmother, <coughs> uh, that one was really hard because. I don't look at who I am as a hero, but I see my journey as kind of this spiral thing. So I struggled with that one, whereas other people might struggle more with the idea of, well, you know, okay, so it's a door, but what does it mean? And so it's really kind of, and I like following all the different people and how they interpreted different elements and which ones were hard and which ones were easy. I love the whole idea of creating an identity, a personal identity, but also a public identity that connects with people from all over the world. Did you did you end up following the same people from week to week, or how did and how did you manage that? Well, um, I I have the uh, fantastic uh, Google Chrome um, application tweet deck, so I actually have a column that captures all of the hashtag Walk My World posts. So I actually read them mm-hmm. all. Um, it makes it easier. And then if there are some like when Kate posts stuff with her kids, I will generally pop out to her blog and see what she's doing because, frankly, I think she's genius. And I wish I could be her when I grow up. <laughs> I think you found the hero, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, so. that, was, that was one of the challenges, though. Um, you know, now that we are, you know, wrapping up this first wave, one of the things... You know, when, when we wrapped up last year and then started this year, one of the things that we recognized is we wanted to get people to connect earlier. It wasn't until later on that people, you know, really interacted with each other. Um, you know, but and so, you know, we started off right away with the virtual high five to get people out there thinking, and we've been pounding away about, you know, discussing their, vig- their digital identity. Well, one of the things that I've noticed is that... Um, uh, uh, many participants, especially some of my students, if you're out there listening, um, you know, it's uh, they weren't paying attention to the feed. You know, they weren't watching Twitter and seeing the feed. They were doing their work, and they were doing their work, you know, because so it then was it a, became a teacher giving an assignment. Right? Yeah, I mean, it was basically, hey, this is part of your grade. Instead of the online discussion, you're going to do this, um, and so they would do the work and some of them are probably feverishly this weekend you know getting caught up but they didn't spend a lot of time going to check what other people were doing on the feed so that's one of the things that I'm wondering for next year is how do we you know uh, support that scaffold that how do we try to get people you know to see the value in reaching out and connecting and building that personal learning network that's a great yeah. question I just shared a link to um to um, the visualization of all the tweets, um, and you know, it, we get the same Death Star effect that all of these um, network classes do, where you have this kind of core group in the middle, um, and then you have hundreds of pe- people that are just, you know, all those dots represent people who probably tweeted a lot, but they never replied to someone. They, um, 
you know, so they, they basically never connected. It was another kind of uh, Bill Kist, who's um, one of his students actually apologized and used the hashtag, sorry for all the mandated tweets. Um, and so it's like, I'm looking at this as like, how do what we... What did that mean, sorry for all the mandated uh, tweets? For the mandated right. tweets. She apologized to her Twitter followers saying, oh, I'm going to be sending out a bunch of junk you don't care about because I have to do these mandated tweets. Mm. Um, so we schoolified her her space. Um, and, you know, we, we all know that that's, that's a general risk. And I'm, I'm with Ian. I don't know what we need to do. Like, we're all, you know, pretty big on Twitter. We probably spend way too much time there. Um, but it's such a, a powerful learning tool. And our goal is to really try to introduce that to these pre-service teachers. And when I look at this picture, I wonder if maybe if we failed or if maybe this is part of the learning curve. Like, you have to, yeah, you know, you I haven't figured out the I haven't figured out the perfect sauce yet to get everybody to just onboard people. Well, maybe it was Twitter. But <laughs> what is that onboarding sauce to get people connected and talking and, and playing in, in open spaces? Um, but this is one of the assignments. But this is what we talked about in the open TTT a couple of weeks ago. Is that you know I try to make the argument that we need to provide opportunities for our students, for our pre-service teachers, for our K-12 kids, you know, to have a guided tour and just start to get into these online spaces. So for many of them, they have no idea there's this fear factor involved. You know, we need to uh, provide like a mentored or a chaperoned tour of, okay, here's what Twitter is all about. Here's how you can connect online. You know, I think that we have been successful because people have been creating and playing with text. Not everybody. Not everybody prompt. Um, Many participants did. Uh, Katie Sylvester, what do you think? This is your work. This is your research. What do you think? Thank you. For um, <laughs> well, I, I think um, one of the things that is really ringing true in our conversation with my experience with Twitter is this is not my first experience with Twitter, but my first experience with Twitter, I was one of those terrified students who didn't know what to make of it, who, um, who didn't... Um, who didn't know how it could be useful for anything but like communicating socially, um, you know, following celebrities, that type of thing. I had never used it and then I was able to um, do a project with one of my colleagues at um, Buffalo State College, well now colleagues, then professor, and um, that was an outlet for me to see it as, oh my gosh, I could use this professionally. and. Um, and so when I jumped in on this project, I, I felt like, okay, this is a chance for me. Because I'm not, um, you know, as a, I'm a, a doctoral student and a research assistant, and so, like, I feel like I'm kind of in this, um, kind of teaching myself the tools that I could use when I am going to be teaching, you know, at the university level someday, or, you know, because I figure... Um, I think uh, this is something that Kate had said earlier. We need to know the tools. We need to be using it. We need to be creating. And if I'm going to, you know, sit here and think, okay, you know, I, I want to teach this. I want to be, you know, um, I, I want to have a digital presence. I need to be able to be using it and exploring it and that sort of thing. And so that's, like, that's kind of where I'm fitting into all this, I guess. Um, and... I feel like, you know, there's a lot of, not, because I've done it before, I think um, in the role of a student, now I can come at it from a completely different angle, and I'm a little, uh, a lot less fearful of it, and a lot less nervous, now more of a um, kind of uh, jumping on it, and not being afraid, and trying to let go of those fears, and I think, um, I think it takes time. If I mean, because I can speak from that student perspective and then moving out of that. So, yeah, I think it, it definitely takes time and, you know, more than one experience. Did, did the prompts make clear, or how did you all make clear in your community of folks that you were all going to do the work too? You know what I mean? So I assume that, that you didn't take these as assignments and say, okay, students, do these. You kind of played you you played the game too. Is that true? Or and how did that become 
like uh, a norm. This was something Kevin and I talked about because um, he pushes me because, you know, Kevin's always 10 years light years it's ahead Kevin of him. Yeah, Kevin Hutchins. Um, and we worried at first because he and I were trying to push each other to try new ways with new texts very early on. Um, is there an almost, can you be too intimidating of a model um, versus just doing the very basic, like, you know, my, my high five, I tried to teach myself how to do CSS animation. I had no idea how to do it, but I wanted to show that you might be learning Twitter, but I'm going to try to learn something, too, that I've never in my life done before. So I forced myself to learn some animation skills. But then I worried, was I going too far, or did I, was I pushing people who might want to geek out themselves? But, I mean, I think it's, to me... This is what happened last year and this year, and this is what happened, you know, in the CL MOOC is you see someone that's just geeking out, and you're like, okay, I see what you did, and I want to step my game up to do better. Um, um, you know, that's – I saw one – a couple of weeks ago I saw it where Kevin posted something, a poem, and then Alicia posted the poem, and then I'm like, oh, that's it. I'm taking your poems, and I'm going to make a found poem. I'm going to remix what you did. Um, so we are constantly trying to one-up each other. Um, for my students, it was a weekly, because I had face-to-face -face classes, it was a weekly getting in their faces and saying, okay, you will not have this opportunity to play like this. I want you to play. I want you to break things online. I want you to go play. Yes, your homework might be just one tweet a week. I want you to do more. You know, and some students profited more from the experience, but I said, you won't have this opportunity to play. Go play online, break things, let's come back and talk about it in class. Alicia, what were you sharing in the, in the chat? Um, I said that one of the things that really, I felt like, took my class's conversation a lot further this year, because I did this, th I did this last year with a class, and I got kind of the same sort of thing where they would tweet once and that was kind of it. Um, and this year, not everybody is tweeting a whole lot, but a couple of people are, and I really think that it's that I have one student who is already really invested in English chat and Ed chat and kind of came into it with a Twitter presence and connected with people really easily and was just able to to talk about that and talk about the ways that it helps her teaching practice. And I think another big part of it is just that she's not me. Um, because, I mean, you know, I can, go, I can post stuff and they'll talk about my stuff and we'll reflect on it in class and we'll reflect on everybody's. But I think that it's really powerful to have another student to, to be able to talk about that too. Because, I mean, it's just like, it's a different kind of authority, I think. What do you mean she's not you? She's, let's see. When I, tell, when I tell them to tweet, they have to do it because it's in the syllabus. When she tells them that she's learning awesome things from Twitter and it makes a big difference to her teaching practice, I think it just has a different kind of, of authenticity, I guess. Mm. I mean... I can, I can tell them that I learn things from Twitter all day, but still I'm their professor. She's, at, she's in the classroom, and she's doing English chat every Monday night and, you know, chats with people and puts stuff up on our blog, and I, I just feel like it's a different kind of authority because she's not the one who wrote the syllabus or decided to do the project in the first place. Does that Stephanie, make yeah, it absolutely is. Stephanie, do you want to jump in with your thoughts here? Um, well, in the this, next fall, I'll be teaching in a, uh, a hybrid school that only meets on campus one day a week. So it, I'm really excited because it's going to give me the opportunity to use Twitter in a way that we haven't been able to do before in education, not only to have discussions, but to also have the kids foster relationships with each other using a class hashtag, using hashtags for different course assignments where they're actually going to be expected to interact because they don't talk about it in the classroom. They don't see each other from day to day. So as they find links that make sense to them with whatever we're studying, they can post that up on Twitter and then actually have a conversation about it and leave me out of it. 
think there's a lot to be said for the peer strength when it comes to things like Twitter, because you can listen to me all day long, like Alicia said, but when your peers do it, then it's cool. I wanted to give Chris Sloan a chance to ask a question that might have been your sitting on there, Chris. Yeah, you know, I've got a few questions. Um, so, um, I guess um, I teach high school um, during the day, and then I teach, uh, I'm an adjunct for a pre-service English teachers in the evening. And, you know, I had some pretty good success when I brought Twitter into the classroom and just like we, you know, we tweeted live, it happened to be Ing Chat Night is when we had classes. And so we could kind of talk about it while we were doing it. Um, and so I guess my question is, it seems like a few of you teach people who are going to be teachers. And, um, and I know we were kind of down that path, but I was wondering what kind of changes do you see in them uh, as a result of Walk My World? Do you get some feedback? Because um, you talk about the research that you're doing. I was just wondering what finding. So a couple uh, cool things that we noticed. Um, we presented on stuff at, at LRA, Literacy Research Association. We have uh, different chunks out there. A um, couple interesting things that I've noticed. Um, it's, uh, I had a, a presentation with Julie Wise, uh, who couldn't make it tonight either. Um, it was interesting seeing students that would construct their digital identity and think about how they would represent themselves online. And they had issues because this project, because the work that they're sharing is open and online, it had a different level of authenticity because of, of audience, as opposed to a Blackboard, not that I would ever use Blackboard, but a Google Plus community or a Google group, you know, threaded discussion. So now I had a lot of students that they, you know, thought deeply about this identity that they were going to represent online. And they had challenges thinking about how that either, you know, supported or counteracted what we think educators should be online. So there's a lot of challenges as they were trying to negotiate what their digital identity was. Um, and it was, it, it was fun. We'd get to the end of the last year, we got to the end of the 10 weeks, and I said, okay, the last learning event is take all of your links, put them in Storify, and then I want you to look across two and a half months of your life, uh, and I want you to tell me who you are. Look at all the content that you shared over the last 10 events and tell me who you are in Storify, put little reflective quotes and stuff like that. And I had a lot of students that would look at their the stuff that they would share and say, well, that's not really me. You know, that's not who I am. And I'm like, well, you shared it, but I didn't, you know. And they're like, but that's not really me. I, was, I wasn't taking it seriously before. Um, and, and I said, well, you know, for two of my students, they said, well, that's not me. Like, I'm, I'm a cool person, and, and that's not who I want to be represented as. And I said, well, you can change it. So I had a couple students that went back and basically redid two months of work in a week or two because they wanted to, to – created a, a more realistic identity, I guess. Um, to me, the, the big thing is, you know, uh, with my students, with my pre-service students, I want them to play with digital text and tools in my classroom. I don't use Blackboard. I use free online tools. I use Google Docs. I use Wikispaces. I don't use Blackboard. I think it's asinine that I have my students learn how to use Blackboard for classes, and then they'll never be able to use Blackboard in their schools. So I use free stuff, and what I notice is that a lot of my students, because they're using those tools in my classes, they're using Wikispaces, Google Docs, whatever, Twitter for this, you know, they are more likely to go out and try it in their classroom. So I have a lot of students that left, and now they, you know, are trying to use Twitter in their science classroom or their, you know, you know middle school social studies classroom. So it's, I think it's, providing those initial opportunities to play with these tools and see that it's not all that bad. But what does everybody else think? I, ha I have a needling question, if I could, yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is that, you know, yeah, um, a, lot, a lot of research in technology happens in classes that are about the technology, right? <laughs> And then, and then when people try to take those experiences and teach 
subject areas around them, it doesn't go the same way. So I'm just wondering if, if that's happening a little bit here, too. Like, your content seems to be the same as your medium, right? Does that make some sense? Which is not bad, you know, that's all good. I'm just wondering, you know, could you teach a philosophy class this way, too? You know, I... I I'm yeah. going to hop in here. Um, I think... <laughs> I think so, um, because the, the 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 real power to design is the is the balance between the global nodes and the local nodes, and we know this tension of the um, of the content areas. Um, it really boiled over last year when we were just doing poetry teachers and these math teachers were saying, rightfully so, why are you having me write poetry? Um, why am I, you know? And so we started planning on. Um, we started planning deliberately on finding different ways that you could hook into different content areas. So we gave we, we would provided examples of ways that um, on what we call a, a maker menu of oh if you want to do this from a social studies perspective here's three ideas. Every one of the um, there was like a we just came up with a bunch of different activities that, that you could do that you know tweak the learning event slightly. Um, so if you you wanted to try a different kind of activity. Um, like, for example, we made a, a fake Facebook page um, activity that people would use um, if they wanted to do it in social studies or in English. Um, but this one was even more deliberate. Like, last year, poetry was the content area. This year, we were very deliberate that we wanted connections and images um, to be the content area because we really wanted people to, to think about new ways of making meaning. So it, just focusing on imagery... Yes, you can focus on images in every subject. Um, look at a basketball play. In uh, that's that's what content area reading means in gym class. It doesn't mean reading a biography of somebody. I stole that from Kelly Chandler Olcott. It means can I read a pick play, um, or can I read a painting in art? It doesn't mean I can read a, a biography of Picasso. That's not what content area reading is. So we we try to we just try to focus in on what does images what does reading images look like in your content area. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Alicia. Do you want? To, let's. Uh, we're kind of getting to the end here. We want to swing around and, and see if anybody else has sort of like a provocative question to ask the group, or whatever you want to think about. <laughs> and let's go in order. Just it's faster than Alicia. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, oh boy. Sorry. Um, provocative question. Or um, anything you're thinking. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say what I just put in the chat, which is that I feel like a lot of the time I really am teaching philosophy. Um, I mean, I am, I am teaching pre-service English teachers, but we're doing a lot of learning philosophy and a lot of thinking about how incorporating different kinds of media and different kinds of modes really changes the way that we think about our subject areas. So. In some way, Walk with Socrates is a total joke. In some ways, it's not. Um, so that, I, I think, is... I think to a lot of people, that would be pretty provocative. But, um, but the philosophy is a huge part of it for me and a huge part of why I've enjoyed it as much as I have. I'm glad your Wi-Fi held up there. Me too. <laughs> <you for> <laughs> <It doesn't> Chris. <laughs> Chris, do you have any comments yet? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I guess... This you're, you're big with KQED, which is like a monthly Twitter thing, too. So I'm just, I keep, as I've been listening tonight, I've, I keep thinking, like, okay, this is like that, but different than that. And right, it's yeah. It's a, a weekly Twitter thing. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I feel like um, I came about this at the tail end, so I would imagine um, you're going to launch a new one next January. I don't know, if is, is it a yearly thing, or...? That's my question. I'll leave. With yeah, we'll, ha we'll have a like new that. one. The, the way that it started was we wanted to have kids, you know, start in January when the, when the weather was pretty nasty outside. And then the hope was as the, by the end of it, you know, it would be nice and bright and beautiful outside. Uh, up in the northeast in New England, that doesn't really exist right now, I guess. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask Sue about that. I'm not so not Kate about that, though. I think the weather's fine down there, isn't it? It's always fine there. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful, 30 degrees and um, lovely. <laughs> Kate, any last thoughts? Uh, for us, um, for yesterday, for instance, 
Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. um, sorry, there's a lawnmower right outside uh, the window <laughs> there, but I've closed the window. Um, but uh, for us, yesterday, for instance, my class, I came in and we Skyped Sue Ringler's uh, pets class. And it was really terrific uh, that the two classes met um, and spoke about Walk My World and their favourite journeys and experiences nice. there. And, um, you know, seeing these, uh, um, having that commonality, I think, um, uh, for my, my class of 20 students, um, they loved having this global audience. They really felt that their work was um, uh, really worthwhile and uh, appreciated. And I think um, that's really important, especially for a very small uh, or regional area. Um, uh, it was really wonderful, these uh, kids. It was the best. And we actually did so much through it, but um, they also have become little experts when it comes to uh, developing um, hashtags. Uh, they know the codes for little when we have our tweet chats with different classes now or other unis or whatever. They'll develop uh, the hashtags. They certainly know when we're running out of 140 characters. And uh, um, it, it, it's just been really, uh, um, yeah, better than I expected actually. Uh, the whole journey with them and um, um, I think it's had a really terrific impact on them as uh, little people that there were older people or you know uni and especially university um, um, students interested in what they had to do and uh, that's a big thing here um, um, uh, very low um, Ian already knows this and Greg and that knows it's very low socioeconomic um, area. Um, I have a lot of Indigenous Aboriginal students and so you know this might be just a little memory that they take with them and it might maybe one day they'll want to um, you know it might just be the little door that hey you know I do know a little bit about you know might get me through the door to university or they they have this discussion at home with uh, with their families that maybe the the, the uh, word university has never been mentioned in that household before so um yeah. It's uh, been a, a terrific journey on a lot of different levels. Uh, yeah, and, and just just to to uh, I've thought of it a couple of times, but and you guys must have thought this through. We can we'll talk about this another time. But the 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 limited ten weeks seems to have created a journey, right? Uh, if it was an ongoing thing, it would be different. So that's worth something that you've thought through, obviously, but. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Katie, and then Stephanie, last thoughts. Um, I'll be, yeah, I'll be brief. Um, I, I mean, uh, like Kate said, it's, it's been a journey. Um, for me, it was really about, um, like, really exploring my identity online um, you, through Twitter and other tools. And um, I think that, you know, uh, one of the big takeaways from this for me and hopefully for other you know, um, teachers, pre-service, whatever part of teaching you're in, um, you know, the use of Twitter and other online, free online tools, you know, as Ian was emphasizing, um, using them in not only like a professional or a classroom context, but, you know, also like to generate, to create. I think that gets lost a lot in schools. Um, and to, to put forth new things and to create and to collaborate that that's huge here and I think um, that was a very big part of the journey for me so it's been a pleasure it continues to be a pleasure I'm glad you emphasized the making um, yeah the, you, you're a lot of making going on Stephanie uh, because I started this as a student and now I'm helping with the organization I have a unique perspective on how it works and since I'm not teaching this year I've actually been able to talk to parents of kids that I don't even know and get them excited about the, the ways that Twitter can be used in something other than just social stuff. And so for me, it's really cool because it's, you've got this, this way to connect with people all over the world who are just like you. I mean, I thought I was an anomaly, you know, sitting here being, you know, forward thinking and unemployed because I'm forward thinking, but suddenly I've got this whole 
circle of people who think the way I do, and it's like, oh, I'm not insane. And it's really cool to be able to do that. And when I start explaining to parents, these are the things you could do, then they get on board, then they get excited, and their kids get excited. So when I start sending off these, you know, seven and eight year olds to universities, they're going to be all over this type of thing, or whatever the next evolution of Twitter is. So it's just, it's such a cool thing. Totally changed my trajectory of study. Cool. Well, thank you, um, everybody. Um, we are uh, going to close out here tonight, unless anybody had any last thought they wanted to jump in on. Uh, one last thing, Paul. Go ahead. We yep. wanted to set up, uh, I think it's April 8th, uh, participants out there, students out there in Walk My World, participants. Um, Paul wants to have you on to talk about the Walk My World project and get your unvarnished opinion. You've heard what we had to say about it. We want to get a bunch of participants and students that have been doing this. Um, that's why I said Stephanie and Katie, you know, come on. Elise just trying to wrangle some students. I'm going to try and wrangle some students. Let's get some people that have done this and let's get the straight skinny on what this really means and, and what it looks like for them. So if you're out there watching and when we share this out on Twitter on the Walk My World hashtag, uh, get in touch with us, DM us, um, mail us something, you know, get on the show. And Kate, does this work for your kids at this time, on the 8th? Uh, um, for Maybe. my kids? Yeah, your, young, uh, your children. Uh, we can't, I can't, with our firewall, with the Department no. of Education okay. firewall, I can't actually use uh, Google Hangouts. We can okay. Skype, but not Hangouts. But what I might do is uh, just interview some of them, and uh, um, I can pop that up, um, cool. you know, even if any of you have some questions uh, that you would like answered, and um, I can um, set up a camera and... Get some s straight answers from them. Funny little cool. things they are. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you all. Um, we, next week we're going. You know, often I, I live in New York City, and often we have an urban bias here. And uh, Karen Fassenpower asked a few weeks ago, could we do a rural show? So we're uh, bringing some rural folks together, and uh, so we're going to talk about issues on from that perspective. Uh, it, it is that open. We're kind of forming it. And then, um, as Ian said, we'll come back to this again on the 8th. Thank you all for uh, Walk My World tonight. Um, we broadcast over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo set up. And I think Dave Cormier would be very happy with this uh, project. I hope he checks it out. <laughs> Talk to you all soon. Bye, all. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good night.